Okay, today we're going to continue talking about uh, categorical data. This we're going to be talking about when we have two categories. Um, and it's another chi-squared, but it's a different type of test. This is called a chi-squared test for homogeneity. That's a tough word. I might trip over that a little bit. Um, we still have the same type of chi-squared statistic. Chi is that like that X. It's Greek. Um, if we take an observed value, subtract the expected value, square it, divided by the expected value. If we did this calculation for each cell, we're going to have cells like we did last time. Each of those would be called a component. The thing that's different here uh, is not the least of which is the test we choose on the calculator, um, but the way our, our hypotheses are set up. What we're trying to do is see, say we have two different categories. We want to see how uh, things are distributed across one category in the other categories, and we want to know if they're the same. If they're the same, they're homogeneous. If they're not, then we could say they're different. Um, that will probably make more sense when we look at an example. Um, for the goodness of fit test, we wanted to know, hey, does this does the distribution of our sample match what we think it should be? So, um, was there a uniform distribution amongst the uh, zodiac signs of CEOs, so on and so forth? Uh, in the last test, our degrees of freedom was just the number of cells we had minus one. Here we're going to have rows and columns because we have two categories. And so we're going to take the row, subtract one, the column, subtract one, and then multiply those together to get our degrees of freedom. The calculator will do that for us, but it's good to know um, just in case you're asked. Assumptions and conditions look the same. We need to have counted data. We need independence. So we need the individuals in our in our study to be independent, or we need less than 10% of the population. We need a random sample, and we um, need an expected cell frequency of at least five again, which is the same as last time. An expected cell frequency is going to be a little bit different this time. Well, quite a bit different, actually, because uh, we're not going to calculate that by hand. The calculator is going to do it for us. And we're actually going to have to run the test before we see if we meet that assumption. Um, but that's okay. If we run the test and we figure out it was a bad idea, then we just don't uh, we don't report our findings. So we here we have some students that go to a college, and you may or may not know this, but uh, especially large universities like uh, the great University of Georgia. Uh, they have smaller colleges within the university. So specifically, like I went to the College of Education at the University of Georgia. And um, so what they're, what they're asking here or trying to document and, and um, draw some conclusions are sort of the postgraduate choices uh, of college students and, and they're broken up into their major. I'm sorry right now this ILR is slipping my mind what this means, but we'll just, this is just another category. So we have two uh, categories. What college were they part of and what is their postgraduate choice? Do they get a job? Do they attend grad school? Or do they have some uh, other thing they're doing? Like uh, maybe they're taking a year off or uh, I don't know, becoming an intern somewhere, something like that. So each of these cells represents the number of students in each uh, that fit, you know, two things, agriculture college, who are going to get a job, so on and so forth. This is something we've looked at a long time ago, but uh, we've worked with these before. So let's start by putting the stuff in the calculator. And I'm already there, so let me show you how to get there. So we need to make a matrix. So we can make a matrix by hitting the second key and then at x to the minus 1 where it says matrix. We want to go to the edit. And I'm going to just choose matrix A. And I'm going to tell it how many rows I have. So in this, we have three rows. 
I can arrow over and tell it we have four columns. And then I'm going to put the data in as I see it. And when I hit enter, it's going to shift me over to the right. And I can just keep putting it in. Just pay attention. Make sure you are putting the right numbers in and they're going in the right spot. Of course, it doesn't know what category it's in, but we want to make sure they're uh, in the right spot. And I can already see that I have one that's wrong. It's good to double check. So now we put in our counts. We want to check assumptions and conditions as we always should before any hypothesis test or confidence interval or before we decide to use the distribution of sample means or proportions. We should always check that we meet the assumptions and conditions. So um, we don't have the full problem here. It's part of the chapter. But we're going to go ahead and assume this is a random uh, sampling of students. Um, it le represents less than 10% of all people who will graduate from this university for sure, so their choices should be independent of each other. And of course, we're not just listing these things, we're explaining them in complete sentences and using context. We have counted data. This is counts of, of students. And so the last thing we need to do is meet that expected uh, cell uh, assumption or condition. And so basically what that would say is like, we have a distribution here of our total number of people who will get a job, the total number who will go to grad school, the total who will do something else. And so we have a distribution of the entire group of people before we break them out into this uh, categories of which college they go to. So if these majors are homogeneous, they're, these distributions are all the same, they'll all be the same as what this distribution is. And so our calculator is going to say, hey, how many uh, grad school engineering majors would we expect if all of these distributions were the same? And the calculator is going to do all that work for us. We don't have to do it. So I'm going to quit out of here. I'm going to go to stat tests. And I'm going to go to this chi-squared, not goodness of fit, but regular chi-squared test. What these are are observed values. This is what we actually observe. So our observed, we're going to choose that matrix we entered our data into. Expected, the calculator is going to do some calculating. And it's going to spit out all of our accepted, expected cell values into a new matrix that we can look at. And then we can calculate. And of course, we're going to get a chi-squared statistic. We're going to get a p-value. Um, so I'm just going to jot those na down now. Now let's go and look at our matrix B. So let's do second matrix. Let's go down to matrix B, hit enter. You can see it's the same size, 3 by 4. And then if I hit enter again, it's going to, it's going to populate the matrix. So each of these values represents the expected amount of students we would expect this for this one be an agriculture major who gets a job out of college, an agriculture major who goes to grad school, an agriculture major who decides to do something else. And so we can arrow over and we can check them all and they're all pretty large. They're all greater than five and so that means that uh, our expected cell frequency assumption and condition is met. All of these numbers are greater than five. We're good to go. And so we've actually already run the test, but let's set up our hypotheses so we can, when we uh, make a determination about the null hypothesis, we know what it actually is. So ultimately, we want to answer the question, are the distributions of students' choices post-graduation uh, same across all the colleges. So our null hypothesis would be us assuming, yeah, it is. The distribution of postgraduate activities is the same for all majors. Uh, we're going to use our p-value to decide whether or not to reject that null hypothesis or fail to reject it. Remember, we never, ever, ever use the word except when we are talking about uh, hypothesis steps. We're not accepting or, or not accepting. We are either rejecting or failing to reject and so if we can reject an all hypothesis, that means the distribution of postgraduate activities isn't the same for all majors. 
So we checked our assumptions and conditions, which you will write out in context. We are skipping over that uh, in a way because we've done a bunch of hypothesis tests and confidence intervals. Um, so hopefully you know by now you actually have to say those things and write them in context. We have a random sample. We, we can say that their postgraduate choices are independent. We have counted data and we check the expected cell frequencies are all greater than five. We actually ran the test to check that. So we have a chi-squared value and our p-value, which we're going to be careful when we look at it because 5.26 looks large, but you got to read the whole book. It's times 10 to the negative 18. That means that thing is almost zero. That p-value is incredibly small. It's almost uh, impossible for us to think that these uh, postgraduate activities are distributed the same across all of these majors uh, and you might you know uh, just thinking logically maybe an engineering major might go and get a master's degree and an agriculture major will go into the field I don't know if that's necessarily uh, the case it looks like by this they're more likely to go to uh, grad school so um, we are going to reject the null hypothesis with a super small p-value. And uh, we are going to say we have evidence to show the p-value uh, of almost zero and an alpha value of 0 0.05. We have evidence to show that the distribution of postgraduate activities is not the same for all majors. The distribution of postgraduate activities is not the same for all majors. So again, some of this stuff is the same. Um, the sort of shell of a hypothesis test is always going to be the same. Um, the way that we fill it out is going to be slightly different. The way we say our hypotheses is slightly different. We have some slightly different assumptions and conditions. We're going to use a different function on the calculator. Um, but we're always going to justify, calculate, and interpret. Um, if you use that method, you can apply that to all of these hypothesis tests. As ever, if you have questions, please be sure to ask before you uh, get too stuck or you go too far. Make sure you do the questions associated with this problem. And of course, make sure you do some practice. That's the way you get better at these things. That's the way that you make this your own. You own the knowledge. Um, just doing one is not enough. Uh, you need to do many. So ask for help, good luck.